Emmanuel, God with us. For the past four Sundays in our sermon series called The Promise, we've been looking at the themes of Advent, and tonight we have celebrated those four themes through scripture, through video, through songs. We clearly see a God who keeps his promises. God's promises brought Simeon hope. He brought the shepherds peace. God's promises brought Zechariah joy and Mary great love. The promises were all ultimately fulfilled in the birth of Jesus Christ. Christmas has always been about excitedly waiting, hasn't it? It's marked by expectation in every shape, way, and form. Can you remember the feeling of trying to sleep on Christmas Eve? I know we have some kids here, but we have some adults too. As a kid back in the 70s in Montclair, New Jersey, our family usually came to a Christmas Eve service just like this, all piled into our station wagon, riding in the way back with no seatbelts, getting from place to place somehow safely. We got into our house, we put on our pajamas and robes, maybe your favorite feedy pajamas if you had them. We turned off the lights in the house and sat in the living room with our green 70s carpeting so we could enjoy the lights of the Christmas tree. And we usually had the little four candles that made the angels spin around and the little bell going ting, 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 ting. Do you remember those? We enjoyed some cookies, some eggnog, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Bing Crosby were all crooning their Christmas favorites on our giant record player, the big console. We hung up our stockings on the mantle that my mom had knitted. And then we went to bed and we tried and tried to go to sleep. We could hear mom and pop opening and closing closet doors, going up and down the steps. And we dreamed. We dreamed about what might be under the tree. And we tried to go to sleep, thinking about what was going to be there in the morning. There's so much to look forward to. There was so much excitement just in the family gathering and knowing that Papa Noose and Belle would be coming later, waiting for people to arrive, waiting to see loved ones, and as a kid, waiting to tear into those presents. Christmas has always been about waiting. And right from the very beginning, 2,000 years ago, the whole world was waiting. Things were dark. Things were bleak. God had created a beautiful world, an incredible universe. And then sin messed it up. People decided to go their own way. And we were separated from God. There was a man named Simeon serving in the temple in Jerusalem. He had been waiting his whole life for the arrival of the Messiah. He had read in Scripture that this Messiah was coming. Simeon praised God for his faithfulness because as an old man, he saw a couple come in carrying their baby, bringing him to be presented to God in the temple for the very first time. And the Holy Spirit told Simeon, this is the one, this is the Messiah. And Simeon shared that joy, that hope with Mary and Joseph. And he told them, this is the Son of God that's been born to you today. A Savior, a light for all the world and for the glory of God to all the nations. As we think about hope today, our hope is not set in some ambiguous optimism for no reason. We don't just wish or believe. Our hope is not based on good feelings or things maybe going the way we planned them to. 
Instead, our hope is set firmly on specific moments in history. The arrival of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us, changing the entire world, turning things upside down. The calendar started over again at the birth of Jesus. And then his life, his death, and his resurrection, actual moments in history. Those are the things we hope in as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, as followers of God. We say that is where we know we're going to have peace with God. That's where our joy comes from. We hope in the salvation of Jesus Christ. Not only in some future hope of eternal life in heaven, but hope for right now, knowing that God will never let us down. His promises are always true. He's always faithful. He will never leave us or forsake us. And that hope is about restructuring the way we look at the world, knowing that things are not the way they're supposed to be. But that in that hope, God promised his son will return. He will come again and he will set all things right. A mark of almost every person within these Christmas narratives is that they were filled with hope about the fulfillment of God's historic promises. Listen to what the prophet Isaiah said in chapter chapter 9, verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. And then in the Gospel of John, we hear more about that light. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. And the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ, God's Son, is the light shining in a dark world. He's the one we've been singing about at Christmas time. And what I love about Christmas is that the whole world stops. Even people who don't consider themselves very religious, they stop and they think about hope. They think about peace. They long for joy. And they want real love. And all of those are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. His hope is because he's the Savior who can heal the broken world. Tonight, is your hope based on something that you want God to do? Or is it based in God himself? Scripture tells us that everyone who repents of their sin and believes in Jesus Christ as Savior, God's promise is that you will have a relationship with him you will see that restoration beginning in your own life. He promises grace to face the challenges that you're facing today. And he promises eternal life, taking his sons and daughters home to be in heaven with him for all of eternity. And then there's peace to a rough group of social outcasts. An angel appeared in the sky proclaiming peace for everyone on earth. You saw in the video Things were not peaceful. They were cowering in fear because they saw an angelic being glowing in the sky. And the angel said, don't be afraid. I bring good news. The shepherds ran to see the newly born Messiah and they left glorifying and praising God, telling everyone they met about Jesus. All the way back to the garden at the very beginning when Adam and Eve chose their own way instead of God's way. A rift was formed by our own sin, choosing our way instead of God's way, separating people from a holy God. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, that Jesus himself is our peace, having broken down the wall between us and God by paying for our sin on the cross. The peace that Jesus brings into our life is not necessarily the absence of of trouble while we all long for that, but instead it's the confidence that we're not alone. True peace can be experienced in the midst of chaos when we recognize that peace is not about our immediate circumstances. Instead, this peace is about a sovereign God who has a plan not only for all of history, but for your life and the lives of your loved ones. 
that God who is faithful to walk with us through even the most difficult times. At this Christmas time especially, our church family and our school family is struggling with so many people that have been sick. And as we think about that peace, we think about a God who is in control, a God who may take some of our loved ones home sooner than we want to, but he still gives us peace and we can trust in him. Isaiah said again in chapter 26, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because you trust in him. If your thoughts are focused on the world, your mind will be in chaos. We find life and peace when we submit to God, when we obey him, when our thoughts are focused on him and his promises. And then there was another priest named Zachariah serving in the temple. An angel appeared to him, a messenger from God. And Zachariah also was afraid at the vision of an angelic being. Zachariah and his wife Elizabeth were older. They had longed for children. They had longed for a family, and they had never had a single child. The news from God's angel was not only that they would give birth in their older age, they would have a son, but their son would be the forerunner of the Messiah. He would be the prophesied one who would make the path ready for Jesus to come. The angel said, He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. His name, of course, was John the Baptist. He prepared the way for Jesus, the Messiah. He told people to repent of their sins, and he called them out to the Jordan River and said, Be baptized as a symbol of your forgiveness, as a symbol of being made clean and right before God, to be ready for the Messiah, to be ready for God's kingdom coming down to earth. This joy that was promised to Zechariah is deeper than feelings just about our circumstances. It's not temporary happiness that comes, even though those presents tomorrow morning will put a smile on your face. Joy is something so much deeper. It's lasting. It comes from knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior knowing that God's promises, all of them, every one of them are trustworthy, knowing that our immediate situation really is temporary and that God is in control. In John chapter 15, verse 11, I'm going to paraphrase this. Jesus said, if you keep my commandments, you'll experience my love. I'm telling you this so that my joy will be in you and that your joy may be completely full. Following Jesus' example, obeying his teachings brings us joy. Our sin nature, what we're born with, tells us over and over again that we know best and doing what makes you happy is going to bring you joy and bring you fulfillment, bring you happiness. God's word says it's just the opposite of that. The things that we think we want are just temporary. They're fleeting. They don't bring us forever joy. It's knowing God and learning to live according to his word when, when we'll be the most fulfilled and we'll have not only the joy of Christ, but it'll be overflowing and spilling out of our lives. Will you decide to live with joy as a testimony to the good news of Jesus' birth? Joy comes from trusting God and his promises. And we can choose godly joy instead of choosing worry, choosing despair or disappointment in our immediate situations. And finally, we come to the greatest gift, love. Mary's story is a beautiful love story between a young girl and a faithful fiancé named Joseph. Mary, as a virgin, becomes pregnant, and Joseph remains faithful to her. He says, I'm going to stick with you, Mary, because I believe God. I believe his messenger. I believe God is going to do something great in our lives. But it's an even bigger love story than that. Because God sent his son to be the savior of the world. The people that he created, the world that he created, God was bringing restoration 
even though his people had been unfaithful. Love is messy. It turns our world upside down. It causes us to do crazy things. Guys write bad poetry and do goofy things. Girls hope that their guy will come around and be the kind of man that they believe he can be. And it changes your priorities. When God's love showed up in the manger that night so many years ago, it caused disruption in Mary and Joseph's lives and in the entire world. The world's greatest need was the forgiveness of sin, to be right with God, and only love and grace could provide that. Jesus Christ offers forgiveness and peace with God. So Mary was willing to take on that disruption. She was willing to be ostracized by her family and her community. She was willing to be pregnant before being married and then to give birth to this son and to follow God's instructions to bring him to the temple, to name him Jesus, to raise him to know his heavenly father. That birth meant that there was a savior of the world. When you hear the gospel, when you hear the good news about Jesus Christ, your life will be disrupted. You'll have choices to make. Are there things that you want to give up because you want to follow God? Are there priorities in your life that will totally change when you choose to obey God and choose to obey His Word? There's disruption when you give up going your way and going God's way. But that's what new life is. We have two choices, to avoid the disruption or embrace it. When God is trying to do something new in our lives, it will usually feel confusing. It's going to feel like something too hard for us to do, but also something exciting. When this happens, what will you do? Will you avoid it or will you embrace it? The first choice is accepting Jesus Christ as Savior. And then after that, it's will I obey and follow him the rest of my life? I would encourage you to do that tonight if you never have, because it'll make your life different for the rest of your life. It will give you peace with God. It will give you hope for the future. You'll have a joy that's unspeakable. And you'll experience God's love, his forgiveness, and his restoration in your life that you'll just want to share with everyone else. God promised hope, peace, joy, and love to all who choose his son, Jesus Christ. This is the greatest gift, the greatest Christmas gift that the world has ever seen. Knowing Jesus means having peace with God, and it will change your life forever. I hope that tonight on this Christmas Eve, if you've never made that decision, that you would make that choice. You can talk to me after the service. If you're watching online, you can contact me through the church office.